In chapter 17, we're going to revisit the study of thermodynamics. Now, we've spent a lot of time talking about enthalpy already, the energy stored in bonds. I want to look at entropy. Entropy is a measure of randomness or disorder in a system. So when you look at a playroom, you could see a high level of entropy once the toddler is unleashed in it. Entropy is given the variable of an S. I don't know why. There's no S in entropy. We've really run out of letters. The units for entropy are joules per mole time Kelvin, and we'll see how those work shortly. Just like finding an enthalpy of a system is not always helpful, but finding a change in enthalpy is. Likewise, we're going to spend a lot of time in this chapter looking at changes in entropy, so we'll be calculating a lot of delta S values. When we're changing entropy, in this case, we're looking at a decrease of entropy. We're making a system less random. In order to decrease the entropy or have a negative delta S value, work has to be done. You have to put energy into the system to decrease its entropy. An increase in entropy would have a positive delta S value, where things get more random. We're going to spend a lot of time in this chapter talking about whether things are spontaneous or not. Think about your own life. What tends to be more spontaneous? Things that increase entropy or things that decrease entropy? Does your room spontaneously have a negative delta S value as you live in it or a positive delta S value? Generally speaking, things tend to get more random, more disordered as time goes by. There are exceptions to this, but generally, when we see an increase in delta S, a positive delta S, we'll think of a reaction being spontaneous. Let's start out with a simple model of entropy, and then we can go more complicated. We can look about entropy in the various phases of matter. We could say that solids are the most organized, or more ordered, of the phases. Liquids, because of intermolecular forces, are starting to break apart, and the particles are becoming more fluid would have a higher entropy than a solid. And then gases, because of the constant random linear motion of the particles, would have a much greater entropy than liquids or solids. We've talked about some laws of thermodynamics in the past. The first law of thermodynamics is the conservation of energy, that we cannot create nor destroy energy in a reaction. The second law of thermodynamics relates directly to what we're speaking about here. The second law of thermodynamics says that for a spontaneous process, the entropy of the universe is always increasing. Now that's somewhat of a grandiose concept, the entropy of the universe. So when we're talking about the entropy of a universe, we're talking about a system that we're studying, and we're talking about its surroundings. The second law of thermodynamics says the delta S of the universe will always be positive if a reaction is spontaneous. Let's think about freezing water. What's the delta S of the universe for freezing water? Well, when you freeze water, the reaction is actually becoming less entropic. It's being less random. But the freezing process is exothermic. And so by releasing heat into the surroundings, you're going to be moving air particles around more. And so the surroundings will actually become more random, more entropic. So the delta S for the reaction is negative because it's becoming less random. But the delta S for the surroundings is positive because the process is exothermic. And so the delta S of the universe actually depends on the reaction and the surroundings. If the delta S of the reaction is more negative than the delta S of the surroundings is positive, then freezing water won't happen. However, if the delta S of the reaction is less negative and the delta S of the surroundings is more positive, then water will freeze. And what we'll see is there is a temperature tendency that comes into this. Sometimes water freezes and sometimes it doesn't, depending on the temperature. What we just saw is freezing water is becoming less random. The delta S of the reaction is negative. But in order for water to freeze, the delta S of the surroundings must be positive. It's the only way for water to freeze. So saying that the delta S of the surroundings is positive is the same thing as saying that a reaction is exothermic. A negative delta H value for a reaction will give you a positive delta S value for your surroundings.
For a reaction to be spontaneous, the delta S of the universe must be positive. That's the second law of thermodynamics. So let's take a look at this chart. Let's say I have a reaction that is becoming more entropic. In other words, it's getting more random and has a positive delta S value. Let's say that the surroundings are also increasing in entropy. Now, increasing the entropy of the surroundings is the same thing as saying that the reaction is exothermic or has a negative delta H. Well, in this case, if the delta S of the reaction is positive and the delta S of the surroundings is positive, the delta S of the universe must also be positive. So, according to the second law of thermodynamics, these reactions will be spontaneous. They will happen on their own. All right, let's look at the counterexample. Let's say the delta S of a reaction is negative and the delta S of the surroundings is negative. Well, the delta S of the surroundings being negative means your reaction is no longer exothermic. It's endothermic. You have a positive delta H for your reaction. Well, if your delta S of reaction is negative and your delta S of surroundings is negative, the delta S of the universe must also be negative, which means that these reactions will never spontaneously happen. The more interesting case is when we get mixed signs. So for example, for freezing water, we said that the delta S for the reaction is negative and the delta S of the surroundings is positive. Again, if the delta S of the surroundings is positive, it's an exothermic reaction. So what will the delta S of the universe be? Well, it actually depends. Which term is bigger? The delta S of the reaction or the delta S of the surroundings? What's going to win that tug of war? Whether or not that reaction is spontaneous will actually depend on the temperature. Remember, this is an example of freezing water. If we flip the signs, if we say that the delta S of the reaction is positive, but the delta S of the surroundings is negative, in other words, this is an endothermic process, well, again, we don't know what the delta S of the universe will be. It will depend on which is bigger, the delta S of the reaction or the delta S of the surroundings. So this will also be temperature dependent. This would be an example of a melting ice cube. Melting ice cube is becoming more entropic, but it's endothermic, so it's decreasing the entropy of the surroundings. Ice cubes melt at some temperatures, and they don't melt at others. Now to calculate the entropy of reactions, this should look pretty familiar to you. After learning about Hess's law, we learned how to find the change in enthalpy of the reaction by using the heaps of formations of products and reactants. And we said that the delta H for a reaction will equal the sum of the heaps of formation of the products minus the sum of the heaps of formations of reactants. The same process holds true for calculating delta S values. The delta S for a reaction will equal the sum of the entropy of the products minus the sum of the entropy of reactants. We'll do a problem in the next video where we calculate the delta S values using this technique. One more topic I want to hit in this video, though, before we do an example problem. I want to introduce you to Josiah Willard Gibbs, J. Willard Gibbs. We have two pictures of a young Josiah Willard Gibbs running around probably the campus of Yale University, and then the elder, more stately, J. Willard Gibbs. Gibbs found a way to calculate the maximum amount of work that can be attained from a chemical process. How much energy can actually get from a reaction? And what Gibbs did is he combined the two concepts that we've talked about already. He combined the concept of enthalpy that we did previously and the concept of entropy, which we've just been talking about. This free energy, as Gibbs called it, turns out to be the perfect indicator as to whether a reaction will be spontaneous or not. Because if free energy is being released, it tells us the reaction will happen on its own. If free energy is going into the system, that means that this reaction is going to need some help. So finally, we have a letter that makes sense. Gibbs free energy is given a G as a variable. And just like we calculated changes in enthalpy and changes in entropy, we will be calculating changes in free energy, so delta G values. Delta G is defined as the change in enthalpy minus the temperature times change in entropy. Now let's remember our units. Delta H was measured in kilojoules per mole. Delta S is measured in joules per mole times Kelvin. So a couple of things to consider. Our temperatures must be in Kelvin if we're going to multiply them by delta S values that have Kelvin in their unit. 
And also our delta S values are expressed in joules and our delta H values are expressed in kilojoules normally. So we have to make sure that we are using consistent units in our calculations. Generally, delta G values are expressed in kilojoules or kilojoules per mole. So let's revisit this chart that we looked at at the beginning of this video. Let's now do this chart in terms of Gibbs free energy. Delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Now if our temperature is always in Kelvin, that means that the value for T is always going to be a positive number. If I say the delta S of a reaction is positive, and the delta H of a reaction is negative, meaning it's exothermic, well now, if I look at my delta G value, I'm going to take a negative number minus a positive number, which means that delta G will always be negative. Free energy will always be released. So that's the definition of a spontaneous reaction, if we have a negative delta G value. If we flip the signs, if a reaction is becoming less entropic, becoming more organized, and is an endothermic process, well now I will do a positive minus a negative, which means that delta G is always going to be positive. So free energy won't be released from the system, free energy will be going into the system, and that's never spontaneous. And as before, it's the mixed messages that are most interesting. If we have a reaction that is becoming less random, but is also exothermic, this is our freezing water example, well, delta G could be positive or negative. And we said earlier that this is temperature dependent. If we look at our equation, we want the delta H term to win out here. We want the negative sign of the delta H term to overwhelm the negative sign of the delta S. So we can do that by having our temperature, T, be a very low value. When does water freeze? At low temperatures. So if I want a negative delta G for the freezing of water, you would lower the temperature. Conversely, if I have a reaction that's increasing in entropy, which is good, but is also endothermic, which is bad, well, that delta G would also be temperature dependent. And it shouldn't be a surprise that these reactions will tend to be spontaneous at higher temperatures. If you want to melt an ice cube, and at the temperature you have, the ice cube is not melting, you can increase the temperature, and at a certain point, that process will become spontaneous.